So dealing with the problems that drive the complaints is what's necessary. The Canadian Human Rights Tribunal hearing into Jordan's principal has wrapped up in Ottawa. She's probably one of the best uh, chiefs, grand chiefs that the Assembly of Manitoba Chiefs has ever had. And our Truth and Politics panel remember Grand Chief Kathy Merrick. Good evening, I'm Dennis Ward. Welcome to APTN National News. Over the past two weeks, there have been six deaths involving interactions with law enforcement from across Canada. Four in the prairies and two out east. APTN News has learned that all are First Nation citizens, five men and one woman. Here's T.R. Wheatley with a timeline of events. Four of the tragic incidents involve the RCMP, while two are city police, one from Windsor, Ontario, and the other in Winnipeg, Manitoba. The first incident happened on August 29 in northern Saskatchewan. 31-year-old Jack Pichet from Clearwater River Dene Nation was pronounced dead on scene after a Buffalo Narrows RCMP officer struck the man with their police vehicle. The officer was responding to a call at 3.30 a.m. and was traveling from Turner Lake to Buffalo Narrows, Saskatchewan. On August 30th, RCMP in Wetaskiwin, Alberta, shot 15-year-old Haas Lightning Saddleback from Samson Cree Nation. According to the RCMP, he had originally called 911, fearing for his life. RCMP responded to the call and the teen ran from police where a confrontation happened. Two officers discharged their weapons. On September 2nd, Tammy Bateman was hit by a Winnipeg police cruiser while it was driving in a park near a homeless encampment along the river. The Indigenous community was swift to respond to this and held a rally to address the issue of police-involved deaths. On September 6th, 57-year-old Jason West was killed by the Windsor police outside a beer store. Police say there were two knives involved in the incident. On September 8th, 31-year-old Danny Knife was shot and killed by RCMP in a Takakoop First Nation in Saskatchewan. RCMP say they responded to a call where a 27-year-old female was allegedly assaulted with a machete. That same day on the East Coast in Elsie Bukduk First Nation in New Brunswick, Stephen Iggy Deedham was shot and killed by RCMP after responding to a wellness check. RCMP say a taser was originally used to subdue him, and when that didn't work, they shot him. All of the deaths are still under investigation. As for the incidents involving the RCMP, APTN has reached out to its headquarters in Ottawa for comment, but have not heard back as of airtime. T.R. Wheatley, APTN National News, Winnipeg. Thanks, T.R. Well, as you just heard, a Mi'kmaq man was shot by RCMP earlier this week. Now his family is speaking out, along with the lead of Elsie Boktuk's community-led intervention unit that is supposed to help RCMP de-escalate wellness checks, who say they were not called by the RCMP. Angel Moore reports. 33-year-old Stephen Iggy Didam was shot by an RCMP officer during a wellness check last Sunday night at his home in El Subutuk First Nation, about 160 kilometers northwest of Fredericton. Amber Joseph is Didam's sister. She says when she arrived on the scene, officers were not administering first aid. But when I came in, they, they, they weren't, they didn't have compression on him. He was shot three times. The yeah. first thing they did was handcuff him and say he was under arrest. He was shot in the chest. He was shot here. He was shot here. He was shot here. I seen the wounds. Family member Kiora Doucette says. I didn't understand was after he was shot, why was he handcuffed? Obviously he wasn't going anywhere. He was down on the ground and they kept the handcuffs on him. The community is outraged. The Canadian flag was removed from the RCMP detachment in Elsie Bruktuk and signs such as Justice for Iggy, a wellness check turned tragic, red handprints on the garage door and do not shoot painted on the door. Corporal Hans Olowet of the RCMP New Brunswick says the detachment is fully operating and the RCMP recognized the deep felt emotions of the community. Kenneth Francis is an elder and says the community is fed up. 
to me, uh, it's just con a continuation of a something that is intrinsically wrong. Uh, and uh, the, the frustration is that there doesn't seem to be anything being done about it. A community-led intervention unit called Indig Watch, which accompanies RCMP on wellness checks to help de-escalate the situation, has been in operation since last December. They would, they would call us uh, when they go on uh, wellness checks uh, on any kind of uh, expected confrontations. We uh, expect to be called and we go there and we try to help the RCMP so that it doesn't go out of hand. Francis says last January, RCMP did call Indig Watch to a wellness check. It was at the dam's house and the situation was resolved peacefully, but this time police did not call. Uh, I, what happened with Iggy is that, and, and as far as my information tells me, is that we were never contacted. The dam died soon after he was taken to hospital. Joseph says when she arrived on the scene, she felt intimidated by the police. I found like he was trying to like intimidate me or like agitate, like instigate. Um, this was the same RCMP officer who uh, had stopped the ambulance from leaving. I had uh, cleared out. I had cleared out behind the ambulance, and because uh, I knew they had to leave. Angel Moore, APTN National News, Jabutuk, also called Halifax. Well, we'd like to hear your thoughts on these fatal police interactions with First Nations peoples. Here's how to continue the conversation. Provide your thoughts, or if you have a story you want to share, you can send us an email to news at aptn.ca. To read more and watch our stories, you can head on over to our website. That's aptnnews.ca. You can also find us online on your favorite social media sites, including TikTok, YouTube, and LinkedIn. Time to step out for a quick break. Still to come, living up to Jordan's principle. A Canadian Human Rights Tribunal hearing has wrapped up today. It's really vital that urgent cases be dealt with in an urgent timeline. In fact, even 12 hours for some children is too long. Welcome back. The Canadian Human Rights Tribunal hearing on Jordan's principle wrapped up in Ottawa this morning. The CHRT has been meeting all week to discuss a non-compliance motion that was filed by the First Nations Child and Family Caring Society against the federal government. APTN's Fraser Needham brings us the latest. It was Canada's turn to make closing arguments to the tribunal on Thursday. Justice Department lawyer Dana Anderson started her submission by arguing against the Jordan's principal complaints mechanism. ISC's position is that a better choice is to focus our efforts here with the panel on the existing problems that are driving the backlog rather than creating a new mechanism. So dealing with the problems that drive the complaints is what's necessary. But Caring Society Executive Director Cindy Blackstock says Canada's inability to deal with its own backlog of tens of thousands of Jordan's okay, principal so requests is precisely why an external complaints mechanism is needed. Uh, the result of that is that families who can't get through on a 24-hour line, who have an urgent case in those backlogs that Canada admits to, who um, has a child who is in palliative care and they can't get the help they need from the 24-hour line because there's nobody there uh, to pick up the call, they don't get the help. That's the default, right? Uh, there, there's no solution. For them. Anderson also told the tribunal that the government would like to extend the deadline for dealing with urgent requests from 12 to 24 hours. But I'm also saying that the cases are becoming so complex that that isn't enough time to do the necessary substantive equality analysis. Um, and so we do need that extra 12 hours. However, Blackstock says moving in this direction could have dire consequences. That is unacceptable. They produce no evidence that their backlogs or their volume are related uh, to the timelines, none. 
and all, it's really vital that urgent cases be dealt with in an urgent timeline. In fact, even 12 hours for some children is too long. The tribunal will now make a decision on the Caring Society's non-compliance motion. Fraser Needham, AP10 National News, Ottawa. The untimely death of Assembly of Manitoba Chiefs Grand Chief Kathy Merrick is still hard to believe and reverberating across the country. She returned home today to Pimichikamak Cree Nation, where a wake and funeral will be held. Our Truth in Politics panel is here to discuss the life and legacy of the Grand Chief. Jennifer Laywitz is a partner with Harbour, Pasqua, Strategies and Prince Albert. And Negan Sinclair is the columnist with the Winnipeg Free Press. Jennifer Negan, great to see you. Uh, tough week here for sure. Uh, Jennifer, let's start with you. Uh, what was the word? Uh, you know, Grand Chief Merrick uh, had quite a, a national presence and many times. Uh, well, what was the word there and her sudden passing in Saskatchewan? Um, I think the reaction was similar to what we saw at Manitoba. There was shock, obviously, um, because it was so sudden, and a lot of sadness. You know, Chief was very highly respected across Canada for being, you know, a really steadfast leader. And I think a lot of our leadership in Saskatchewan and, and our First Nations people were, were shocked and, and sad. Negan, were you able to take part in any of the ceremonies? What were you hearing people say about Grand Chief Kathy Merrick? Oh, you could not be, you could not not be a part of the immense grief that our community is experiencing here on Treaty 1 uh, involving such a brilliant and dedicated leader. Uh, I wrote a column where I said in, uh, that uh, she's probably one of the best uh, chiefs, grand chiefs that the Assembly of Manitoba Chiefs has ever had. She had this very small term. Uh, she fit, she ended a previous grand chief's term and then uh, was re-elected resoundingly with a uh, powerful majority amongst the grand, the chiefs of Manitoba as the grand chief. Um, and then on top of that, she her legacy on certain issues will be stamped for a very long time, particularly on the search the landfill movement here in Manitoba, but then also the reformation of child welfare. Uh, they were just uh, involved with the final stages of the child welfare big settlement here in Manitoba over the mistreatment of children in the child welfare system by provincial authorities and the federal authorities. So uh, their, her legacy is deep. And as she told my daughter one time, uh, she was just preparing seats for others like uh, young people to come and eventually take those seats. So she was really a person who thought of others first. Uh, Jennifer, uh, Grand Chief Merrick is being remembered as a leader who got things done, especially as Negan mentioned with the search of the landfill, but she was uh, very vocal on issues impacting First Nations peoples. How do you think she will be remembered? I think you already said it, how she will be remembered. I think she'll be remembered as somebody that, you know, took a stand on a lot of really important issues. And, you know, like Nigon had said, right now we're in the middle of some really heavy issues. We're talking about Bill C-92 child welfare reform um, with the big deal coming from the federal government where we need our chiefs to be active and to be at the table having these conversations to decide whether or not that deal should go through. Um, you know, the search of the landfill was a big one. There was families that needed advocacy there. Um, we're also hearing about the RCMP and the Indigenous deaths that are happening at, on within the hands of the RCMP and police across Canada. Um, so I think there's some a number of big issues right now and losing somebody that was so monumental and such a great leader is is going to we're, we're going to feel the impact for sure. Uh, Nigan, what do you think uh, the legacy is that Grand Chief leaves behind? So uh, there's a really famous kind of moment here in Winnipeg, and you kind of have to be in the middle of Winnipeg politics to really experience it. Uh, there was a uh, demonstration on the step of the, of the legislature. Now, of course, Manitoba is well known for having the first First Nations premier of a province in history, uh, Wab Canoe, uh, but he may or may not, uh, but certainly in certain circles, like the circles that Grand Chief Merrick traveled, uh, was moving perhaps a little slow for the families who were wanting searches for their loved ones at the Prairie Green landfill. And she stood on the steps of the legislature and demanded quite forcefully using very strong language, the premier move. Uh, and regardless of where he comes from, that he get off his butt and 
take some action. Uh, that, I think, is indicative of, of Grand Chief Merrick. Uh, nobody was going to stand in her way when it came to the advocacy of her people. And unfortunately, I think, you know, in the course of her duties, it's a very stressful job. And I think, if anything, that this is a reminder that uh, we, at times, I think, are hard with our leaders as uh, First Nations, Inuit, Métis people. Um, but these are very stressful positions. These are positions in which a great deal of stress and at times your neglect of your health takes place. Uh, and I hope that what we remember is not just the brilliance and the beauty of Grand Chief Merrick and what she did, but also that we should be gentle. We should be caring and kind with our leaders who are trying very hard at times to, in a very stressful environment with very monumental obstacles in front of them, uh, that we should be uh, standing with them and support them too. Yeah, I think a lot of people will remember that speech on the ledge there and uh, yeah, a lot of people expressing concern about the crazy schedule that she was definitely keeping there. Uh, thanks, uh, Jennifer and Negan, to you both. Yeah, miigwech. Thanks. Time for one last break. Still to come, we'll hear from Corporal Crystal Caribou on this National Police Women's Day. I always had an interest in the back of my head growing up that maybe one day I'll be a police officer so that I can represent uh, my community and uh, be a representative in the RCMP as well. Welcome back. Time now for our photo of the day. Alessia wanted to share a look at her firework peppers that she's growing on her balcony in Winnipeg, Manitoba. Hope they grow to full maturity because they're looking delicious. Remember to send your photos to share at aptn.ca for the chance to be our next photo of the day. Now let's take a look at Friday's weather forecast. Starting on the East Coast, showers in 26 in Fredericton, 24 in Halifax. 10 with showers in Kujuwak and Nain. 28 in Montreal, 27 in Val d'Or. Sunny and 28 for Sault Ste. Marie and North Bay. Showers in 25 in Thunder Bay, 28 in Sioux Lookout. In Northern Manitoba, 25 in Thompson, Gods Lake and Norway House. Showers in 26 in Winnipeg, 23 with rain in Dauphin. 20 and rain in Regina, showers in 18 in Saskatoon. 15 with rain in Meadow Lake, showers in 18 in La Ronge. In northern Alberta, cloudy in 18 in high level, 15 in Fort Chippewan. Showers in 18 in Edmonton and Red Deer, rain in 19 in Lethbridge. Rain in 17 in Vancouver, 23 in Kamloops. 16 with showers in Prince George, 14 and rain in Smithers. 11 in Old Crow, rain, and 13 in Whitehorse. Cloudy and 18 in Yellowknife, showers and 17 in Norman Wells. Zero in Saks Harbor, eight above in Politak. 10 with rain in Chesterfield and RVF. Plus two in Resolute, cloudy and six in Joe Haven. Women make up 23% of Canada's police force. And that's up from just 9% 30 years ago, according to Statistics Canada data. On National Police Women's Day, they are being honoured for their service. Reporter Sierra Bettens caught up with Corporal Crystal Caribou to talk about her experiences as a First Nation policewoman. September 12th is National Police Women Day, and today I'm joined by Corporal Crystal Caribou, who comes from Matthias Colomb Cree Nation. Um, Crystal, to start off, um, I'm curious to know, what made you interested in a career in policing? I've always had an interest since I was a teenager. I noticed there was um, not much of a police presence when it came to Indigenous representation in the RCMP. And I always had an interest in the back of my head growing up that maybe one day I'll be a police officer so that I can represent uh, my community and uh, be a representative in the RCMP as well. Um, so that was where the thought kind of started and then as I got older I realized I wanted to finish school before I you know, pursued that, that career choice. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, no, you know, historically, Indigenous peoples haven't always had the best relationship with the RCMP. 
How have you worked to, you know, rebuild that trust as an RCMP officer? Um, growing up myself, I um, had also a negative view of policing, and I um, wanted to know why and where those thoughts were coming from, and um, I wanted to make a change, make a difference, and uh, that was one of the reasons why, as, uh, as to why I joined the RCMP, just to figure out for myself, um, can I make a difference, and um, can I uh, see why I'm having such a negative um, exposure or, or thoughts about the RCMP? And when I got in, I realized um, RCMP officers or police officers in general, we get exposed to a lot of things that people don't see on a daily basis. So growing up, back to what I said about me having a negative experience, a lot of times it was probably um, maybe the officer was having a bad day or, you know, we're, we're, um, we're going to traumatic things. So being on the other side of the door now and being in that police officer role, I kind of have a better understanding as to all the things that we have to go through as police officers. And, and there are hard days, you know, we're exposed to a lot of things. But at the end of the day, I always remember, you know, I chose this career to make a difference and to um, hopefully um, be a positive role model and build those relationships in the community. And that's what I take out most uh, days is hopefully I help someone out today and hopefully I, I made a difference just by being who I am as an Indigenous police officer. And I've really noticed too with speaking to community members where I've been that a lot of them feel I think more um, at ease or more willing to come forward and talk to me because I maybe look like them or they know I'm from northern Manitoba as well so I think they realize oh she probably understands. Um, which I which I do, and at the end of the day, we we are just here to help. Mm -hmm. And what would you say has been the most rewarding aspect of your job so far? Um, just uh, knowing I'm helping someone and hopefully making a difference wherever I go, and um, being that safe net for people, and being there for when people need help. I could be one of those people that show up and maybe make a difference or or help them keep people safe. Mm -hmm. And, you know, if you were to give advice to an Indigenous woman who's interested in a career in policing, what advice would you give them? I would say you're not going to know unless you try. So don't be afraid. If you are afraid, that's a normal feeling. But I know you could do it, and it's possible. Any um, choice or career that you want to do, it's possible. You just need to do um, some hard work have a positive attitude about it and confidence. And you learn as you go. It, even in my career right now as a police officer, I'm still learning and you're gonna always learn and um, grow, which is good. And that's one of the other reasons why I chose this career is I knew I was always gonna be learning and, and challenging myself for the better. Well, thanks so much for taking the time to chat with us today, Crystal. And yeah, best of luck with your career. Back to you in studio. Thanks, Yara, and thanks to Corporal Caribou for sharing her insights and experiences. That's all the time we have for your APTN National News tonight. For much more, visit our website, aptnnews.ca. I'm Dennis Ward, Marcy Miigwech. Thanks for being with us. Have a great night.